I'd like to welcome everybody as they're coming into the, the virtual building um, as we get ready for uh, our Jacingo Speaker Series event. It's with great pleasure that today uh, we host Kelvin Baggett. Uh, Kelvin has had a distinguished career uh, in the healthcare space for, for companies uh, like HCA and Tenet Healthcare. Uh, currently a significant uh, player in the private equity space. And uh, of course, a graduate of the Fuqua School, uh, a board member of the Fuqua School, and I'll, I'll probably come back to that. He's done so many significant things for the Fuqua School um, over the time of, of his relationship with us. But uh, Kelvin, uh, I've left out one extra thing that I'll come to. Uh, that is uh, that is effectively a full-time unpaid job, but welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Bill, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. So uh, the thing I left off is that you are a czar. Uh, you know how cool is that to to be the Dallas healthcare czar? Uh, and and I say cool facetiously because that has to be an incredibly stressful role. But, uh, but in terms of having how many people in your life have you met that have ever had that title? And so when, when you were a kid, did you ever think that one day you would become czar? Absolutely not. It, it never entered my mind as a kid growing up in Fayetteville, North Carolina. <laughs> so, so, uh, so to prepare yourself for this moment where you're doing so many things for so many people, uh, you, you have this extraordinary background in terms of the, the number of degrees that you've accumulated, the experiences that you've accumulated. And so I'm just curious, and, and now that you've added this title uh, of czar, are, are people just completely intimidated by you and, and afraid to say anything, knowing that, that they're like dealing with this, uh, this superhuman person? Uh, so I, I'm curious how people respond to uh, all of your accumulated expertise and wisdom. Well, I, look, Bill, I thank you for the flattery. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much of that is deserved. What I will say is I get more questions pertaining to how did you come to get that title? And what I respond is, no, I never desired or sought out to be um, the czar, um, but it does get a reaction, provoke a question, and then typically gets a response. Um, so I want to I want to actually uh, take you back in time to uh, when this offer was made to you, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I've already kind of articulated the uh, the financial rewards, which are zero, and mm -hmm. the the time demands, which are enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, but on top of that, uh, it it puts you in a position to be responsible in in an environment where Dallas is. Uh, at least as complicated as other parts of, of the country in terms of the, uh, the, the confusion, the, the differences in signals and messages and directions in the terms of the combination of the federal, the federal efforts, the state efforts, and, and the efforts of the city of Dallas. And so when, when, when this offer was made to you, what went through your head uh, in terms of, uh, should I take this on? Yeah, well, I, I was approached about this opportunity on a Saturday afternoon where I was minding my own business. Um, but I responded to a question from Mayor Eric Johnson, the mayor of Dallas, and then he paused. And after that pause, he said, I really need someone who can help to pull this together. And uh, I said, well, look, I'm happy to help. And I was thinking I would help to identify that person. And instead, he went through a variety of things which, similar to what you just cited, were um, the kind of experiences, backgrounds, and maybe credentials that he was looking for. And those sounded uh, so similar because he was speaking to, I'd like somebody who's got a background in medicine, who understands public health, who understands business, and also has had experience managing crises. And um, I said, OK. Uh, and, he, and I said, okay, how can I help with that? And he said, you can help by taking on the role. And so uh, I said, I have to talk to my two superiors, which were one I had to pray and then I had to talk to my wife about it because I, I had some appreciation that it was going to be um, 
quite a challenge. And, and I can say quite frankly and candidly that it's been even more of a challenge than I anticipated. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you do have this, this background uh, in terms of you, you do have the medical degree, you do have the public health degree, you've got the business degree, um, and, and all of those things end up being important. But I'm it, kind of from a parochial point of view, I'm curious, um, what is it about your, your Fuqua experience and your business experience that prepared you for this moment? Absolutely. So, and I think that's key, and I'm glad that obviously we're talking about this, and this is a great place to talk about it, is that this is a title without a designated team. Um, and so it really does require me to work um, using influence and to be able to engage people, to be able to to convey a message that is resonant, that is compelling, uh, that will also bring people to the table. Uh, it also requires me, as you've alluded to, to navigate politics and power and positions. And I think that Fuqua was so helpful in that because Fuqua, in the experiences that I had there, were really around how do you begin to bring together people with an aligned goal, recognizing that you don't have control over them. And this is really about how do we get inclusion? How do we get contribution? And how do we get alignment? And so that's, those are the skills that I'm, I'm using here because again, while I may have the title, uh, I am also not someone who is in a, uh, a position uh, with a large and expanded team. I'm having to work across various aspects of government and across various aspects of community leadership. So uh, to follow up on that point, you, you wrote an opinion piece with, uh, with some other individuals where you, you said, hey, if we're going to tackle this COVID problem, we really need to bring together players from government, from business, uh, from the, you know, the community leaders and so on. Uh, and, and so can you, can you say a little bit more about what you view to be the business sector's responsibility as we, as we try to move from what is currently a very bad place with the pandemic to, to a, better, a better place? Yes, thank you. I will, I'll go, I'll add one piece um, before I come to that particular article that we, we wrote, and that came out very recently, was about a week and a half into this role after I had done listening sessions, after I began to, to, to go through a significant amount of data, uh, we formed what is now called the Dallas COVID-19 Alliance. And that was because I recognized that there were so many uh, disparate pieces and silos and that alliance convenes leaders in the business community. We have everyone from the Dallas Federal Reserve to other business leaders, to health and healthcare leaders, faith leaders, um, philanthropists, and various branches of government. Because we wanted, I thought it was necessary to have a place where we could convene, where we could share information, where we could set strategic priorities, and then we could align around the activities to promote change. In combating the virus, so that's 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 a piece of the puzzle. The article that we wrote, um, the the thing that we wanted to highlight was that this is critical to all of those domains, but it's incredibly important that we also make strategic investments in this, and that is because I think as we we now better understand that until we get a really good public health response that helps to reduce the spread of this virus, our economy is going to lag, and it is incredibly important that we continue to reopen safely uh, for a variety of reasons. And part of that is because we already have higher levels of unemployment than we've seen in over three years. Um, and that we need to address things so that we can get the economy going so that people can have the resources and meet their needs. And so that's where business comes to play. Uh, the other piece of that is that business is a strong voice in what happens within the public health community as well. Um, I, have, I have seen a lot of things move uh, in the months that I've been functioning in this role by key business leaders also reaching into government and other aspects and saying, we need to get this done and leveraging their influence as well as their company resources to advance those aspects of the agenda. Yeah. So the, the, the thing about uh, this pandemic uh, is, is that it's just, it's, 
a terrible threat to, to so many people. I, mean, I, I call it a three-headed monster in terms of the, the threat to uh, your, your health and uh, your well-being in that regard, your economic well-being. Mm -hmm. and, it's a, and it's a crisis of social values where it's, it's really exposed that there's a social contract where we're not living up to that social contract uh, for certain members of society. And so you're, you're simultaneously dealing with and this health crisis, this economic crisis, and this crisis of, of fairness, equity, and justice. And those three things are, are all related. And so how do you, how do you balance, and you, you mentioned this, this interplay between the health response and the economic response, but how do you balance all three of these things as you figure out how to allocate your time, the advice you give, and so on in this role as health star? Yeah, so one of the other things so, um, that we, we did was I wrote a, a paper which was a guide, really a guide around how to protest during the pandemic and how to do so safely. Um, and the reason that I chose to do that was because as you, as you mentioned, we still have this, this issue around social value and this calling for improvements in overall racial justice and police reform. And we had to acknowledge that those things were not only ongoing, but they were uh, necessary to promote the change. And so put together a, a 10 step guide into how to do that safely to, to promote those activities, and it wasn't just for protesters, it was also for the rest of the community and also for law enforcement, how they might choose to respond uh, appropriately to those who were protesting peacefully. So um, that's a piece of the puzzle. The other thing is that I've also um, worked with other officials and others who are not officials to continue to promote this need to return to um, some level of economic activity so that we can reduce the increased risk that some have. In addition, we've also promoted how to engage in essential jobs where um, protections may not have been as easily implemented. And so we work with companies to help to improve upon that as well. So I've touched a lot of pieces of it. And what I've said is it is not a, an either or. We have to do these things uh, somewhat simultaneously to promote and equip the calls and for changes in racial justice. Uh, we have to also uh, work to make sure that people can go to employment if that is necessary for them to maintain their jobs and how do they do that safely. And we also have to promote social behaviors and other activities so that we can curtail the spread of the virus. So you, uh, your reference to this guide that you wrote, uh, which is really extraordinary in that it was written not just for the protesters, but for law enforcement and for the broader community. How, how do people respond to that? And do you feel like it, it made a difference in terms of allowing people to exercise their voice without endangering the community? Yeah, well, I can tell you that uh, I had a variety of responses um, that came with, you're gonna write what? What are you talking about putting together? And I put it together over a weekend involving other experts so that they could opine on it as well. We wanted to make sure that it was fact-based and also from publications who said, I'm not sure if this is what we want to promote. Uh, fortunately, I found a, a good enough audience to be able to say, let's disseminate this because it's helpful. And we have found those who are leading protesting efforts to say, this was very helpful because you gave us things to consider. You know, who might want to participate, who might not based upon health conditions? How do they uh, safely engage? What should they do when they get home? How should they monitor? And additionally, I work with uh, local testing to make it available. So testing it became and continues to be free and accessible for those who are protesting. Um, and we gave them a window of time in which they should monitor their symptoms. So uh, there's been a mixed reaction to this, but most of it positive. Um, I also had law enforcement from other cities who saw it and uh, it helped to guide some of their policies in terms of what they might choose to do. Um, and how they might choose to support these efforts as well. So overall positive, uh, but there has, and there was a mix. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was curious about whether 
uh, this guide uh, had legs and, and made it to other communities where it, where it could also be of value. So that's, that's great to hear. Uh, so uh, if I go back to this incredible pr uh, career progression that you've had uh, in, in terms of how you made the choice to initially go down the path of a career in medicine, uh, kind of what I understand is that growing up, you observed these health disparities. And this is something where you thought that personally you could make a difference uh, in terms of uh, addressing health disparities. If you think about what will happen as a consequence of COVID-19, it really has expose these health disparities in, in, a, in, a, in an appalling fashion in the sense that, that, that these are really terrible consequences. But do you think that there is the possibility that this will lead to positive reform in terms of addressing those underlying disparities? I do. I'm more optimistic now than I've ever been. Um, the level of transparency is higher than it's been. I also see the interconnectedness of this to the global pandemic as also being a, a positive factor, if you could say, coming out of this as well. Um, people, I think, more now than ever recognize the interconnectedness and the interdependencies of other people's health, not only to their health, but also to their livelihood. And so I am, I am more optimistic. Uh, I've recently also uh, talked about putting on another hat. Uh, I'm part of a national health equity work group, which is, um, has some incredible people who are participating, and I'm glad to contribute to that effort as well. And I don't think that the level of, of activity that we've already gotten, the level of interest um, that we've already received from various quarters of, of the community and leadership uh, would have been as high had not we had this, this constellation of events um, that has occurred most recently. So uh, kind of following on this, this path of your, your personal career journey, uh, what, what was it that led you to decide instead of being a physician that I'd like to be a part of the, the business community in terms of the way you harness your talents? Yeah. Well, it came during my, my medical training. I was uh, involved in operations and policies um, and uh, was in a meeting and we got to the discussion around uh, finance, how this is really going to get operationalized and how this is going to get funded. And I was with an esteemed physician who was also a policy leader and we were asked at that point to leave the room. And I, in the hallway, as we were walking away, I, I asked him, I said, and I think it was just a courtesy. It was one of those, thank you for your contribution to the discussion. We will follow up with you um, in a sense. And we're in the hallway and I asked him, I said, do you, um, what do you think is gonna become of what we just presented? And his reaction was, his response was, well, I, I think they'll take this on. And I said, I'm not so sure. And I took that meeting and then a series of other meetings where we were in conversations and it came down to resource allocation and felt like there was a silence that came in those who were trying to advocate for some change in health or wellness or clinical care delivery and said, I need to amass those skills. I really need to better understand that so that at the very least I can be more effective in my communication. Um, fortunately, um, Duke exposed me to so much more when I came to Fuqua and the health sector management program um, and the diversity of healthcare industries that were represented helped to further inform my, my thinking around ways that I might be able to drive change. As you mentioned, one of my driving ambitions has been the elimination of health disparities since I was a kid, even though I didn't articulate it that way. Um, and so I found that there were a lot of other ways to do it. And one of the most effective ones was to be able to go into a business environment and, and to look at things strategically and comprehensively and then to determine how resources might be allocated to drive that change. And, and so that's where I've positioned myself uh, ever since I uh, came, came to Fuqua and, and since graduating. 
So you, you in the last few years made a pivot out of the, the healthcare delivery space into the private equity space. And, uh, and so speaking of disparities, uh, I would say probably the, the private equity space is not well represented with people of color. Uh, there have been issues uh, that people have highlighted in terms of some of the systemic issues uh, that may lead to ongoing economic disparities with respect to access to capital and so on. So, so give me your your kind of your motivation for the the pivot into that private equity space, and, and tell me a little bit about how, how you feel that's working for you in terms of being able to kind of follow through on your, your lifetime ambitions? Yeah, uh, I would say it's, uh, it ranks amongst the hardest things I've ever done. And um, for, for one of the things you just cited, there, there's a very small um, community and representation of people of color, with, people of color within the industry. Um, and that's wherever you go across the spectrum from BC to Gros buyout. And so um, that, that is one thing that you, you have to be aware of, and I've become more cognizant of. The, the, second, the second piece of it is, is it's incredibly difficult for those of us who are newer in the space mm -hmm. at times to get the same attention that those are larger and well-established. So that's, that's been another challenge that's been associated with it. The reason that I moved into the industry is because I see it as a, 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 a tremendous way to drive innovation in care um, to drive innovation in health and wellness, um, to bring together the skill set that I've amassed and talk about how things might be adopted and applied. Uh, I've also spent a little bit of time working on payment activities at the federal government level, advising them. And so I have some appreciation for how reimbursement plays into this from that perspective and also from my operations background. And so it just gave me an opportunity to say, I can take these experiences I can help to drive innovation. It still helps me to impact these communities um, and to do it to do it differently. Um, it also, quite honestly, helps to address the intellectual curiosity that I have in terms of looking across the spectrum and thinking about really what change might look like and where opportunity and need exist. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to, so the, the way I probably should have said this at the very beginning, but I'm, I'm going to ask you my questions. And then uh, we've also collected uh, some questions from the FUQA community. And so I'll come back to the, some of the, the, the private equity questions. Uh, but, but I want to kind of drill down into something that, that you made reference to before, which is that we've been living in, in highly polarized times. And, and one, one would have hoped that in this pandemic, that, that the pandemic response to the pandemic itself would not be seen as polarizing uh, or political in any way. And yet that too uh, has become polarized. And I think that's a function of anything that we drop into uh, society uh, because it is so polarized. Uh, any event itself becomes polarized. And so I'm just curious what advice you have for us and, and all the, the leadership lessons that you've learned uh, over, over this distinguished career, which is in this, in this highly polarized world, what, what can we do to bring t people together with common purpose, uh, when when we seem to lose sight of the idea of common purpose, uh, and instead say that you know it's all about me, uh, how do we how do we elevate problems in a way that we get people to work together? Yeah, so I, I'd like to say I have the answer, but I will I will share some thoughts um, regarding that, and I'll I'll use some of the ways that I've navigated it here locally. Um, one is. I had to better articulate what, what our objective is and what it was at that particular time. And so I said, we wanna reduce harm and suffering within the Dallas community. Then we aligned around what, what measurements and metrics we had to attach to that. So that was the second thing that we did. The third was also acknowledging that we're, there were various entities that needed to be included in the conversation and that including them would be beneficial not harmful. 
Um, and so some of those people were outside of the room and my objective was to bring them inside the room. And then the, the fourth piece to that was then to, to say, how do we acknowledge each of our contributions while also understanding, so I'm gonna go to politics, that we have a variety of constituents, stakeholders, and previously established positions that we may have to also respond to. So that was, that was the, the fourth key piece. And I'd say that with that, we've made some advancements. I talked about the alliance we formed and the way I got people to the table was walking through those four elements and then not saying that I was going to hold them to anything publicly that at least we hadn't in some sense already discussed privately. Um, and so they didn't have to worry about being put in an awkward or compromising position. Okay, well, that's, uh, that, that's really helpful uh, to, to learn from your experiences and get your advice there. So um, switching closer to home, uh, you've been unbelievably connected to Duke and you, you've given back in, in so many ways uh, over over time, you, you're doing this event today. You've been a graduation speaker. Uh, you you serve on our board. Uh, you've endowed a scholarship, uh, and you are the founder of the Minority Alumni Advisory Board. And so, kind of a, a broad question, which is why uh, why why do you give back so much to the school? And, and then I want to talk particularly about the, the motivation around uh, the alumni, uh, the Minority Alumni Advisory Board. Okay, absolutely. Well, that's because it's family. Like Duke and Fuqua are family to us. Um, my kids on any given day are very likely to be running around in some Duke paraphernalia. They're six and eight, um, and um, they've already put their stake into uh, they're, they're schools of interest, and you can imagine <laughs> what that looks like. And so, um, it's um, Duke gave me so much when I when I was applying to business school. What I asked for and sought, and I even wrote in my one of my essays that I wanted a resource rich environment that would give me access to those resources. And from the first month of school. I got exposed to people in the School of Public Policy and Law, and of course I was already engaged in the, the medical center. And I was thinking about these sometimes wildly crazy ideas in terms of how to drive change. And they were, they were embraced, um, they became more informed and better shaped. Uh, and that in and outside of the classroom uh, is very much um, a part of how I've become who I've become and why I've been able to do some of the things that I've done and why I've had some of the successes that I have. So in my opinion, I owe so much to, to Duke because it's given me so much. But the other thing is I can say is that when Duke continues to advance and evolve in a way, and Fuqua I'll speak to specifically in that regard because obviously I'm a lot closer to what's going on there, that continues to make me proud. Um, Fuqua continues to confront things that are are difficult and, and challenging at times, doesn't shy away from that. The things that you're leading now and the community's leading around how do we create change in this environment where change is being demanded um, around, along some racial lines and, and what that means in terms of the education and business community, I think are to be applauded. And I'm just glad to contribute in any way that I can. Well, thank you. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate that you feel that way. Uh, so, so go back to the, uh, the the formation of this Minority Alumni Advisory Board. What what got you into action? Uh, what what problem were you solving by creating that board? Yes, and I and I will say that I, I can't have this conversation without giving a lot of credit to Derek Penn and Owen May um, because we had a lot of conversations around some formal structure. And the reasons were, were many fold, but just a few to highlight were, we had a, a minority community that was very engaged as students that we identified and understood from working with the school and others that became less engaged as they graduated and moved into the alumni status. And so we were, we were trying to better understand that and also provide some connectivity there. The, the second was we thought it incredibly important for the current students to have a connection 
with alumni that was uh, more easily attained and with the larger community, not just individuals who may have been um, more easily identifiable or raised their hand just on an individual basis. That was a that was the second piece. The third was we looked around at some other institutions that that had something, and we we have this 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 kind of ego and pride that came with us as well, and said why not why not Fuqua? Why shouldn't we have something uh, analogous to that? And so that was the impetus for the board. We wanted to have a place where we could have formal representation, where we could have a more um, concentrated voice, where we could get some. Um, dialogue around things and some agreement that we could then promote in advance and shape. Uh, we wanted to have connectivity to the students on an ongoing basis in the community. And quite, quite frankly, we also got to, this is a way for us to in, increase the visibility around the financial contribution and also to increase that financial contribution. So I was very frank and upfront, uh, I think with you and others, and certainly with those that I was looking to engage, that um, it was important that that be reflected in what we were doing as well. So uh, thank you again for, for that. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you're, you, you have some pride in, in the many legacies that, that you have given to this school. Uh, so switching, switching to more of a personal question, uh, you, you have not engaged in, in what I'll call job hopping by any means, but you have made decisions mm -hmm. to to make transitions at various points in your career. And for, for any member of our community, whether they're a current student or an alum, um, these are decisions that, that you will face. And so I'm curious, what's the, what's the mental calculus that you go through um, in making the decision to uh, say, leave an HCA or leave a tenant and uh, or, or to frame it in the positive, to, to join uh, a new organization. Uh, how, how do you make those choices? Yeah, so uh, I, I'd say that in retrospect, <laughs> they probably um, thought of a little bit differently than at the time. And, and I'd like to say all of these things are calculated. Um, I always start, there's prayer and there's reflection around these opportunities, but I, I usually look for opportunities where I can make a difference, where I can be a part of driving change, where I can have an impact. Um, and that's what leads me, that's what's led me to the variety of, of, of situations in which I found myself, even within the companies that you're highlighting, I took on a, a variety of roles. So um, those things evolve. Within HCA, I had at least two and maybe two and a half roles during my tenure there. Uh, at Tenet, I had multiple changes in my job description as well as in my title. And that was because there was a need and there was an opportunity and they felt and I felt that I could contribute to that. Um, I like problem solving and I like building teams. So I also look for um, opportunities that give me a chance to do that and to do that in a way that I think best maximizes what I'm trying to accomplish and what I can contribute also. So given, given that track record of success uh, in, in being able to do those things that, that you're looking for, uh, I'm curious, you've, uh, you've been able to navigate some very complicated environments and you have been able to bring people together uh, to, to act with common purpose and, and really to improve the human condition ultimately. So I, as you know, I've often been critical of the political world, uh, given their inability to, uh, to move together uh, and, and make progress. But given these experiences that you've accrued and your success in, in bringing people together, is it possible that we'll see a pivot into the political world at some point? Well, well Bill, I can answer that uh, unequivocally, uh, no. <laughs> I have... I have no desire to go into politics. And quite honestly, that's what's also served me well in this, this czar role, is that I was able to come to the table and tell them that my only interest was, again, reducing harm and reducing suffering um, and saving lives as part of that. And so I wasn't here for any positioning for a future role. Um, so uh, uh, I, I hope my wife is listening to this. So now I'm on the record publicly as well, but the answer to that is, now, I've had some opportunities in the, in the past 
uh, where that was presented to me. And I decided then that that business was a better path for me to drive and to contribute to the change that I was seeking uh, to make. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's, uh, I guess that uh, that may be some political world loss, but uh, perhaps a net societal gain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm now going to, uh, to switch to some of the questions that, uh, that I've been given by, by our community and from, from the current students that, uh, that they'd like asked. So uh, the first one is you, you've touched on to some extent, which is, uh, what what is the the real value of private equity um, in the healthcare space? And and I think the answer I heard before was it, it's to drive innovation. But can you can you talk a little bit about why private equity can drive innovation that you can't produce organically, say uh, within existing structures? Yeah. So I'll speak from a, a, the public the public um, publicly traded company perspective first, and. What I can say there is that um, because of the, the, the visibility that you have, because of the variety of stakeholders that you have, um, that can be a little more challenging to do some things innovatively within your balance sheet. And again, that's, that's a generalization. It's going to vary from company to company. And I think that some do it remarkably well. Um, and we could probably all cite many examples of that being the case. Um, the, the private equity space, what's really attractive there is that is their role. Um, and I'd go to earlier stage private equity in that regard um, to really identify innovation, to be able to um, determine if that can be commercialized, determine how that's going to be then monetized, and then to help to grow and nurture these companies. And so people are giving them capital with those objectives in mind. Um, so that's, that's why I think the private equity community is very well positioned to do that and to take some risk that might be a little more difficult for more established companies. Okay. So the, the, the next question uh, wants, wants to get into your head a little bit here. Uh, and, and the question is that uh, uh, healthcare providers and investment markets and say private equity investors may sometimes have conflicting goals. Mm -hmm. um, so how is your perspective as a, as a PE uh, investor been shaped by your experiences as a healthcare provider? Yeah, I think there, again, you go back to where there's, there's some common goals that you can establish. And, and what I find, and even this week, I've had conversations with a, a number of large systems. And part of that conversation is around where might there be some innovation that can help to address some of these underlying disparities. And one of them was very upfront with me that there are some degrees of difficulty for them undertaking that given their current front print and asset mix, but they would love to participate or have a, a high interest in participating in some vehicle that allows them to contribute to that, that doesn't create a high degree of risk exposure um, and to do it with others who also might be aligned in this effort. So I, I think that there is there is an interest, and the, the question is, is how do you navigate that path so that you can bring um, capabilities and so you can bring resources and so that you can also distribute risk in a way that's acceptable to these various entities? So it, it, the, you didn't necessarily reject the premise of the question. So uh, let me give you a second version of the question, which is, uh, is it a false dichotomy to talk about kind of the healthcare perspective and and the financial perspective uh, that an investor might have, um, or, or do we really need more people like you who can internalize both the, 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 the medical implications um, along with the financial implications? So in other words, do we need, do we need more people who have degrees in, in medicine or public health and an MBA? Well, it'd be easy for me to say yes. Uh <laughs> I think what you need are people who um, come with a core skill set and also a willingness to look more broad, right? So I, I think that if we go to Fuqua, for example, I think that what Fuqua exposes you to as a member of the community in general, so as a student there, and also through the health sector management program, helps you to appreciate the various dimensions of health and health care. And not just healthcare. I think Fuqua helps you to think about health as well. 
And so I think students who emerge from those type of programs and Fuqua specifically are very well prepared to engage in a dialogue that allows them to express an appreciation of these various points of view and then to determine paths where you might be able to achieve some common goals and some, some um, shared success. So uh, the, the next question makes the observation that uh, a robust healthcare system is probably as important or even more important than a strong defense sector in terms of mm -hmm. looking out for the public good. Uh, given that, do you believe that investment in healthcare should be subject to more stringent governance than other investments? Well, I, I don't. I think healthcare is already a highly regulated, highly scrutinized aspect of our overall economy. Uh, what I would tease out is that we've made significant underinvestments in public health, and that's why we're seeing right now um, some of the things that we've discussed: the pandemic and also the social values and disparities are because we have um, we've underemphasized public health and the need to do more investing there. So that, I don't, I don't think it requires more scrutiny. I don't think it requires more regulation. I think it requires more commitment and that commitment needs to come with a bigger check. Okay. So uh, with, uh, with the pandemic, we, we've seen the, the enormous uh, human cost um, in so many ways, but in your space and driving innovation and so on, what are the what are the sticky things you see coming out of the pandemic in terms of innovation that will actually make us better off uh, when we get to the other side? Well, I'll say one of the, the most remarkable things has been the acceleration and the deployment and adoption and payment for telehealth. Um, it's, it's one of the areas that I've had an interest in since I was in medical school. And um, even as recent as the beginning of this year, uh, placing some bets, I was thinking about and talking about and forecasting against these longer hurdles and the, the horizon that awaited us and in a matter of months and pen strokes and executive decisions, <laughs> it changed dramatically. So now we have more telehealth uh, accessibility and availability. We have more mental health uh, services being developed um, through um, these telemedicine services as well. We've also seen an increase in remote care and monitoring. Um, and so those are areas where I've just seen this, this drastic um, acceleration of things that I thought were gonna take years to unfold. And so you think now that, now that that's, that's out, there's no putting it back in the, the, the uh, kind of, nope, we're not gonna pay for telehealth because you can go back to the doctor's office now. Well, I think if you look at the factors that we said was one is we don't know if people will accept it um, we don't know if physicians will adopt it. We can't determine if we have the full capabilities to deploy it. And we have these regulatory and reimbursement hurdles that we're going to have to overcome. And so all of those things got addressed. Now, it, it went as high as we went from about 12% adoption to around 40%. Do I think it's going to stay at 40%? My answer to that is no. But do I think it's going to, the pendulum is going to swing all the way back? I don't, because again, we, these five areas that we saw as key considerations have uh, in many ways been addressed. So uh, next, next question is something that we've, we've made reference to, which is the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Um, and so given the broader context of this social values crisis, this, this crisis around racial justice. Um, what are some of the most critical issues that we need to tackle in order to ensure that our vulnerable communities are, uh, are protected and well provided for? Well, one of them is access, access to quality healthcare. Um, if, if, we, if we even talk about, just, just I'd go back to Dallas because I've obviously spent a lot of time in the data here we could have predicted who was most likely to be adversely impacted by COVID-19 just based upon the limited access to healthcare and some of the other vulnerability research that had already been done and had been longstanding and known in various pockets of, of the community. And those are those individuals who are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So we have to address healthcare access. 
We have to address health literacy. We just talked about telehealth. Um, I'm having a lot of conversations with diverse stakeholders uh, in that particular area because it's not just about closing the digital divide. There are so many other aspects to make it effective and successful. Um, so we have to do that. We have to talk about nutrition um, and making that more available. Uh, one of the other things that we haven't talked about yet, but is also fundamental to this is that we've also seen the education divide and its contribution to these health disparities as well. There are all these determinants and we have to take them on. And so what I'd say is we have to address healthcare access one, we have to address a telehealth and, and making it available to those pockets as well as a means of access. Um, we have to continue to address the essential needs, food security, and other aspects as well. So there, there are a lot of pieces to closing this gap, um, but we have to start with that. I, I'll tell you one thing that was shocking to me when I came into the role is that we were having people who were receiving tests and some who were getting positive test results, but did not know where to go then for treatment um, that information was either not known to them, was not provided to them. Um, and so that's something that we took on um, as well. So one of, the, um, one of the aspects of this crisis uh, has been an exposure of some frailties in our supply chain. And uh, that, that some of these basic necessities in terms of protective equipment and testing, uh, testing materials have been in woefully short supply. Uh, some have argued that our strategic stockpile was, uh, was, uh, was too low, yeah. uh, knowing we could have such a pandemic. But do you see in response to these challenges uh, around supply chain issues, a mandate to move manufacturing locally um, so that we may have less disruption of those supply chains. So in other words, we're going to see more kind of designated uh, you know, in, you know, industry activity as this is in the national interest and therefore opportunities to think about where, where you can build business opportunities. I, I don't know how much of that's going to be sustained. Um, I think market forces are going to still come into play there. And the reason I say that is because we had local businesses that started producing a hand sanitizer, others who started manufacturing masks um, and tried to find other ways to address some of these scarcities. And um, just not sure how long that's going to be sustained. Some of them uh, have said that they're going to go back to their previous business as soon as they can, or some have already moved back that way, I moved back in that direction. Um, because these larger uh, vendors and manufacturers have been able to scale up some of their activity um, as well, so globally. So I, I don't have the answer for that. What I'd say is uh, that if you can create the right business, if you can, if that also includes having that production demand, um, the match from a supply um, demand perspective, as well as um, a reimbursement stream that's uh, more um, predictable, then there, there should be a business opportunity. I just can't say exactly where those are or how long those are going to be uh, in existence. Okay. So um, the, the next question kind of ties into Duke as university and the local community. And once again, there's an observation, which is that the Duke has both a leading business school uh, and an incredible uh, medical school healthcare system uh, and so we're uniquely placed in some sense with that combination to have an impact on the local communities in which we operate. And so here the question is, what, what advice can you give to Duke in terms of effective community engagement so that we can really be of service to the, the local community? Well, um, I appreciate that question. What I, what I would say is, um, Duke obviously has many of the, not Duke, Durham has many of the disparities that we see in other areas of the country, right? And so um, what role Duke can play in that regard? I think Duke started taking those things on when I was a student, and I can't say that I can speak to all the progress has been made, but I think there's been some. And that is not, not having this, we had a divide like so many college towns with the town and gown where the universities existed um, but they really weren't active parts of the community. 
And again, going back to my days as a student, I saw not only more interest in that, but also more activity around that. I would continue to promote that. Having a, a leading business school and a leading healthcare center, I think does allow um, you to come together and talk about how do we help people to understand that, yeah, there may be trade-offs to be made, but there also may be some opportunities to have a mutual benefit and a win-win scenario. And I think that the community is, is resourced and positioned to do that, especially when you bring in uh, the School of Public Policy as well and the Schools of Law. I mean, there's just, there's so many other aspects to it that I think can shape those things. And I think the third thing is exactly what Fuqua is doing, which is, uh, again, not shying away from the current conversations and demand for change when it comes to racial and social injustice. Um, you've taken that on, and you've not only taken that on, so many people have issued uh, these, these letters or proclamations uh, that I, I, I quite honestly, I, I'm still questioning how much true tangible impact there's gonna be around that. Um, but again, speaking specifically to Fuqua, you have taken that on in a very meaningful, tangible way. And I think that's what's necessary. People are anxious and eager uh, for change and real progress. And you have to demonstrate a real commitment to doing that. So I, I would say that's, that's something that is going to move and advance the needle, especially in the way that you're doing, not only for Fuqua, but also for Duke, um, because I know that'll be shared. And also with the other business schools and leaders in the business community, because of the way that you have continued to disseminate the thoughts and the thought leadership that that centers and comes out of Duke. So, uh, Kelvin, thank you. Thank you so much for all these answers. That's the, the last of the student questions. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. So if you'll permit me, uh, I, I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, I think, just one more question, but uh, but I may have others that pop up. But the, the question is this, which is, We've seen so many people struggle with the following tension in the middle of this, this time, which is so incredibly difficult for so many people. Mm -hmm. and the tension is between being honest and transparent and, and letting people know the truth of the situation versus a desire to create a sense of optimism uh, and, and you're going to be okay. Because the reality is that the people are are scared to death and, and are dying. Mm -hmm. uh, and so tell us a little bit about how you walk that tightrope in, in terms of, of balancing those issues. Yeah, it's really hard to navigate. I mean, I'm, I'm going down a stream of boulders on one side and I have uh, these, these tree limbs on the other. And so it is a delicate balance. What I've, what I've pointed to is that we're taking meaningful and real action and to be very transparent around the progress that we're making while also not ignoring and quite honestly acknowledging that so many people are, are hurting and that we want to extend ourselves to them. So I'll go back here to what we're doing in Dallas is we convened um, community organizations to talk about how we get engaged and involved and directly impact and influence those communities. And so what do we do in terms of testing? How do we bring essential services? What do we do in terms of supporting workplace policies? And also one of the things that I was working on this morning with others is around how do we provide some financial benefit from those philanthropists and others who wanna be generous in this capacity. So that's what we're, so I'm saying we have to maintain some degree of hope, but we also have to be very practical. And that is, I'm not telling you things are just going to get better. We're also taking very discreet actions to demonstrate our concern, our compassion, and our commitment to helping you to manage and navigate in the current environment. Thank you. So uh, you know, I've asked you a lot of questions. Uh, there, there may be some questions you wish I had, I had asked you, but I didn't. Uh, but, but I do wanna ask uh, a question specifically for our students, which is the, the opportunity for you to uh, to give them advice as they uh, as they are going through a transformation in the midst of uh, this extraordinary crisis, and so how how do they how do they keep themselves on track, and how do they create their their own sense of opportunity and optimism in the midst of such challenging times? Yes, it's um so um, I I will I will say that. 
the, the greatest long-term benefit and value that I've seen from my Duke education and my Fuqua education specifically is that are the relationships, right? And so uh, the, the things you learn in the classroom, the incredible professors, the ability to challenge each other and to be challenged are wonderful. But the things that continue to be a part of my life to this very day, and, and I got a text this morning, from a fellow alum. And so what I would say is leverage technology, uh, leverage the other resources that are available to get connected with people. And fortunately you have techno technology today that didn't exist in the past because that will, that will help you in so many ways personally and professionally. And I think that what Fuqua does incredibly well is promote a culture. And so, so Bill, I use quite often, and I do give you credit, the IQ, EQ, and DQ. And so that we do have really smart people who also have emotional intelligence, but who are also incredibly decent. And what you will find is that these are relatable people who are looking for relationships. And Fuqua is not transactional. You talked earlier about what we give the Fuqua. Fuqua continues to give us so much more back in return, and we're deeply grateful of that. So to students, I'd say take advantage of technology, learn everything you can, but also use that to connect and form relationships um, because some of my greatest, strongest relationships and members of my family are fellow Fuqua alumni. So Kelvin, uh, I'm gonna stop asking you questions Thank you so much, though, for demonstrating for, for everyone who was able to join us today that you are an individual who is just off the charts in terms of the IQ, EQ, and DQ, and role modeling for us what it means to be a leader of consequence. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Thank you, Bill.